Nigel Stevens. Why did you take your cat and move to Thailand? Oh, getting right to the good stuff, huh? Uh, I think I, I realized I had to do something different because I had a great job. I got uh, catered lunch every day, snacks, drinks. It was a cool job. I enjoyed it, and I still felt like I just had this nagging urge to blow everything up and try something different and see what happened. And I've been to Thailand before, and I thought, okay, I could do that. So when I sort of wanted to hit the reset button, it naturally came up as a thought. And I didn't want to go anywhere without my cat. I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. So I both blew up my life to do something different and start working on new things and also relocated my feline companion, which was every bit as ridiculous as it sounds, but somehow ended up working out. The the cat is a Western cat, yeah? Yep, got him in Arizona, then lived in San Francisco, then was in Thailand, and now he's here with me in Barcelona. So he has traveled more than, I don't know, 75% of the U.S. population, I would say. When you got to Thailand, did the local Siamese cats accept him? Or did he feel <laughs> like an outsider? Uh, well, he definitely felt like an outsider because I assured that his uh, impact with stray cats walking around on the street was minimal. But I'm sure if he had had more interactions, they would have welcomed him as one of their own, since I believe he originates in blood from that part of the world. Did you see any sort of racism in the cat world? <laughs> Uh, I, I can't say that I could speak to any of that beyond what uh, beyond whatever those animals tend to get up to normally. Right, and now and now you're in Barcelona. I am. So why those two places? Because you could have gone anywhere. You're a digital nomad. You could have booted up that site. What's it called? Nomad List or something? Right. It tells mm-hmm. you the cost of living. What What was it? What was the gravitational pull of? Thailand, and then Barcelona? Well, actually, I would reframe the answer to fit a different question, which I've gotten that question a lot, and I've thought about it. And it's actually, there's a bit of a paradox of choice when you can technically go anywhere, because I have my computer, I can start working with new companies remotely, I can continue the work remotely, I've built a team remotely, so I could be anywhere. But then you kind of fall into this trap of, like always thinking about where you want to go next. And I mean, at uh, risk of sounding like a cliche kind of for me made it difficult to sort of even live in the moment. And when I was thinking about anywhere I could go the first time when I went to Thailand, it was kind of overwhelming because to your point, I could go anywhere, but it was very simple. It was, I'd been there. I liked it. I liked Thai food and I was starting out as a sort of at the time freelancer. So the fact that it was, quite uh, economically feasible was good. And then after a couple of years, I loved it there, but I wanted to be on a less ridiculous time zone. I had never lived in Europe uh, and I wanted to go somewhere where I could have a better chance at learning the language. And I already knew some Spanish. So when I filtered down to Europe, speak Spanish. Oh, and then also I wanted to be in a big city and preferably on the water. It went from any destination in the world to one of a couple places on the Spanish coast. So that's I came here and liked it, and there was a part of me that thought, what if I don't like it? What if I could go somewhere else? And I just made that voice shut up. I said, no, like, it's good here. Don't overthink it. It has everything you would need, and I haven't looked back. So tell us, uh, you say you work for a lot of different companies. Uh, give us just your background in a nutshell. Talk to us a little bit about, it, about your work at Big Commerce and the mattress company and that whole thing. Yep. Uh, so I did some work in the B2C space, both as you mentioned, at a mattress company. It was sort of like how I got started. I start, Even when I was in university, I got some weird online job writing SEO copy, whatever that means. To this day, I still don't even really understand what all these repetitive pages were for. And then I got a job as an SEO analyst in San Francisco that I was in no way qualified for, but I guess I somehow talked my way into. And then that really forced me to think like an analyst and think more quantitatively and build more scalable solutions. And then when I went to big commerce, 
it was sort of more about fusing that with a co- with content management on helping them scale their content program. So I sort of took the basics you learn at like a weird s- scaled B two B SEO setup, and then I had to apply it to a more refined B two B situation. That's where I really learned. There's sort of all these. SEO and content fundamentals that sort of work on paper and in spreadsheets. But when it comes to B2B companies that are selling, you know, ten, fifty, hundred thousand dollar solutions or whatever, you can't just have this on paper strategy and seamlessly deploy. You need to take a lot of other things into account. And I think that's really where I started carving out my niche of being able to understand the data driven SEO side of things while also trying to be a more complete marketer that's required for sort of a mid to higher end B2B product. Uh, Just a quick note for our listeners. If you hear jazz piano in the background, my son aspires to make it into this big honors band. So he's practicing all day, every day, and I can't make him stop. So, uh, but that's okay. Good background, good background music. It's pleasant. Um, let's, let's talk about this concept of organic growth in business. What is organic growth in business? Uh, I suppose there could be a lot of different definitions. To me, it is the two main principles are it is non-paid and you try to build loops that take advantage of leverage that you already have. So non-paid, even just basically defining that, you know, there's AdWords and paid search, there's paid Facebook, there's paid stuff on LinkedIn, whereas organic is more inbound. How do you create assets that either kick off a flywheel or just exist in a place to be found by people who are looking for that? So a big part of that for me is SEO and content, which I always say are two sides of the same coin because SEO is helping your pages get found by Google. But the content part of that is really how you actually differentiate it and fill it up. So my main focus is there and then sort of everything in between is all of the weird murky offsite stuff. Like if you actually want to get found, you need to get links. And if you actually want this content to generate ROI faster, you need other people to talk about it. So how do you take offline relationships and turn them into online growth loops? That's another big thing that I'm always thinking about. And what's the opposite of organic growth in business? Uh, I think a good sort of example without naming any names is there's a lot of these D to C companies that have raised crazy amounts of capital and then deployed it very aggressively. And you even see that they're going through a lot of cuts now because when they see any lull in the market, it's sort of like a tap that you can turn off or turn on, but you haven't actually built anything. Now, a lot of them, they sort of build what I would call like brand equity and then paid marketing, but they don't actually develop a lot of the organic assets that they need to turn that brand that has some magic into making sure that it's being found by people that are looking to solve the problem. So I would say a heavy reliance on paid marketing of all kinds, which I don't think is bad to clarify. I'm not some, I actually think when you're, when you're looking at a model for organic, a lot of the time when you're starting from zero, it takes a lot of time and paid is a great way to validate concepts and to just quickly learning from customers and start getting more customers. So I'm definitely not against paid. <laughs> if you think about the channels owned, shared, earned, paid, is there a logical sequence that is consistent uh, with different clients or is there some sort of methodology by which you structure which channels to hit first? Um, I would say I usually come in at the phase with startups where they've generated some brand and they've gotten some PR and they figured out some aspect of paid and then to the point where they say, okay, like we're well past product market fit. We figured out who our audience is, but right now our CAC to LTV is not where we'd like it to be. So how do we take all the things we know and turn them into an organic unpaid pipeline? And that's, that's cost of customer acquisition and, and customer lifetime value? Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. So, like, usually one of the main metrics that startups look at is, and I say startups because I work with a lot of startups, is what is your ratio of customer acquisition cost to lifetime value? And then what's the payback period on that? So, if you know your LTV is 100 grand, 
then you could theoretically spend 25 grand to acquire a customer and it would still be a four to one CAC to LTV or LTV to CAC. So, you know, like children, companies have different needs at different stages of their corporate evolution, right? A startup has different needs than a change up or a company in pivot mode, a scale up with a proven product market fit has different needs than a grown up company that dominates its market. What are the unique requirements for doing SEO for a startup with relatively no traffic to build on? Mm, good question. So um, I think there's sort of strengths and weaknesses for that position. What I often find with startups is they're actually in a position to do well with organic, but they haven't capitalized it on it yet. And what I mean is when startups, for example, one of the best things you can do for organic is raise money, which might be a little counterintuitive, but you know, you get a tech crunch link, you get a link from all these other sites, people start searching for you and Google sees those signs to be okay. We're getting links that say, this company is a platform for X, which then tells them, okay, this company is authoritative on this. And then another thing Google looks for is brand search. And when you get a little spike in your brand search, it's like a sustained lift to your perception, your perceived value in the eyes of Google. So I think the, the negative is that you sometimes don't have much to start with and you need to create assets from scratch. But the positive is if you're at that stage where you've built a little bit of a name for yourself, that name translates into search engine credibility. That means that you don't have to wait forever to start seeing results. You can actually see something in the short to medium term, especially when you go after very niche uh, keywords. And I think that's something that a lot of companies get wrong where they say, okay, we want to we're a company that helps with customer support. So now that we're doing SEO, we need to rank for customer support and say, no, 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 pump the brakes. Like what's the, what's even the specific keywords related to your product that you can jump out of the gate and get traction for to then build up your credibility. So I think that's the unique thing where with startups, you have to take more of a gradual approach, start with the more specific things. Whereas when you're a big company, like I've worked with a public company where they were ranking in the top 10 for, uh, like a keyword around loans with hundreds of thousands of searches, yet they hadn't done anything to quote unquote SEO that page. But just because of their equity over time, they were, they were able to rank for it. Whereas a startup can't go for something like that in the short term. So when you talk about, you know, going for these sort of niche keywords, these longer keywords, you know, how small is too small? Do you, do you go for something that's showing you, you know, 50 searches a month? If it's right on the money or do you kind of where do you for a startup that's starting fresh, what is a good sort of number of monthly searches in a tool like, I don't know, say SEMrush to start at? Yeah, so I think the, the disclaimer would be there's no right answer for that. But just to give uh, a couple of examples. I find keyword research tools are very helpful directionally, but what it's easy to mistake is estimated monthly searches for a keyword with traffic you could potentially get. So for example, I have a plugin in Google search console Google search console is sort of your portal into your keyword data and performance on Google. And it shows, you can see how many impressions you're getting for certain keywords. And this plugin pulls in the search volume and lo and behold, I see everyday keywords that supposedly get zero searches a month, getting 10, 20, 50, 100 plus impressions. And when you add up these different variations of keywords, it could end up actually being like tens or hundreds of visits. And when it comes to a specific keyword that really defines your brand and that you are better poised to provide a solution for than anyone else, I would say if you could get 50 qualified visitors uh, to a highly targeted page, how would you think about that with paid? With paid, you would easily think, okay, I can get 50 to this. I know that I'll convert X percent of them and you do the math. But sometimes people don't apply that to organic when it's actually even better because you just, you just have to create this page once and then you have compound returns over time. So, and then the other aspect I'd say is your cost. Like if you can spin up pages easily, then the reason for not targeting a bunch of these keywords with 50 searches a month isn't really there. But if you don't have the infrastructure built up, it might be worth your time to 
keep invested in paid for the time being. Do you want to share the search console plugin? Yeah, it's called Keywords Everywhere, which I am in no way affiliated with, but maybe I should be because I bring it up whenever I talk about SEO. All right, let's let's shift gears for a second, and let's let's talk about enterprise, and let's talk specifically about enterprise customers that are completely clueless uh, about digital marketing, what it is, how it matters, let alone SEO. So, and, we're, and what I want to do, I want to role play a scenario with you, okay? All right, so, we're already moving on to the role play. Let's yeah, do we're going to role play, and I am going to be John Waldron, the president of Goldman Sachs, okay? And we, I'm, we're sitting down because I need to SEO my website. Let's role play. You ready? Go for it. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, John, I believe it is. So I shit money. What do you do? <laughs> uh, I am a laxative that enables you to shit more money. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Uh, okay, tell me more. So people know who Goldman is, and there's a certain uh, – you, you don't need my help to make money, but – there's a certain subset of consumers who are in an undecided phase with whatever, with whatever your products are. So, for example, you have the line Marcus, which is the personal finance products. And I was actually in, a, in this position recently where I was looking up high-yield savings account. Now, since I looked this up, all the high-yield savings account have gone to nothing, but that is neither here nor there. So what I would focus on with organic is how are you being mentioned and ranked in different review sites? And then when I actually look up uh, like high interest savings account, the page that's ranking, how well is it optimized? How many internal links do you have to that page? When you look at competitors, should you build more backlinks? Is there anything we can do to generate more of a tailwind around that? So there's people who are looking up your products and you want to be found by people who are looking up the type of product, but they're not necessarily looking up Goldman. So let me ask you a very simple question. What is SEO? I'm John Waldron from Goldman Sachs. It's not my world. How do you answer that question to a sort of a checked out B2B decision maker? What is SEO? When you look up anything in Google, the results below the paid part, when you don't think about marketing, you just sort of accept them as what they are. My job is to propel companies to the top of those listings for the type of queries that align to their customer's journey. But we're already the biggest name in investment banking. How, how would SEO help us? Well, I have this uh, search keywords report here that says, although you're the top uh, investment bank, there's a bunch of touch points with customers across different products where you're not being found. So in the same way that, uh, what is, what are some of those stats about advertising where it's like familiarity equals liking. And when you see a brand advertisement and you go to the store, you don't even remember seeing an ad for Windex, but you're familiar with it. So you pick it as opposed to other ones. It's that same thing with SEO for enterprise where it's, it's almost about more of a real estate play where for every one of your products and offerings and services, you want to be found to maximize those customer touch points. And we all know that those customers could each be very valuable to you. And the cost of creating a page is negligible in the long run. So that's why you should care, John. And how do you go about getting that done? Well, that's the million dollar question. Uh, I'd say a summary is make sure that you have the right content. So if I look up high yield savings accounts, or I look up how do I invest my $10 billion or whatever it is that Goldman customers look up. You have a page that's optimized for the queries that people are most likely to search for that matches the user intent and directs them to take a next action. And that you have a website that is structured so that the most important pages can be found by Google and people. And that, when people mention you that you sort of help them link to the proper pages because Google looks at 
external links from other sites to your website as a factor. So when you, it's like technical on page and off page, those are the main areas. It's interesting, you know, cause it's such a broad discipline. There's so much going on. There's so much more than just keyword research and, you know, tweaking uh, metadata. Um, and it seems like, you know, the sweet spot really is if you're, if you're a high performing sort of elite SEO, the sweet spot really is software as a service, because at least in that market, you're not explaining to them what SEO is. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, when, yeah, when you talk to sort of either smaller businesses or more traditional businesses that have then adopted a web storefront, you're going to end up kind of having this circular conversation where you're trying to explain to them what you do and why they should care. Whereas in the enterprise B2B space, I don't talk to anyone for the most part where I sort of have to explain the value. Usually they say, okay, I get it. I help them model it out and quantify it to make sure it's worthy of both of our time and investments, but they under they get it. So your point is a hundred percent accurate that, and this space is great because a lot of these companies that are born and live and hopefully don't die online, they have to know this stuff. So even if they're not great at SEO, they generally know, okay, like we know SEO is important. We, we just suck at it so far and we haven't been able to invest time and resources in it and it's been deprioritized. So given that we're now in this, you know, post pandemic environment and um, you know, there doesn't seem to be, an immediate fix on the horizon. You know, it seems as though this is a long-term problem that we are going to continue to contend with. Um, how does that impact those smaller and traditional companies who maybe have been resistant to technology up to now, been able to be resistant to technology because workaround, analog workarounds were available, but now they've been ripped away. Now they almost have to compete online. Do you think we're gonna see a mad dash uh, to the internet for all these uh, sort of legacy companies and small businesses, or do you think still no? I've already seen it in some areas. For example, I work with a B2B company that provides route optimization software, which basically means if you do any type of delivery or outbound kind of logistics where, you know, you have to go to multiple destinations, it's one of those things that you don't think about until you think about it and you realize how complex it is. Like uh, if you have to make a bunch of deliveries, how long can a driver work? What's the most important? What's the right order given traffic and other conditions? And it's endless and it's, yeah. I don't have close to I, the I did some work ride. for a similar company ah. that provides rides uh, for medical transport. Interesting, yeah, yeah so you're they familiar. do the route uh, software, but also the yeah. billing to Medicare. Yeah, and even just the routing part is inc incredibly complex. So anyway, uh, aside from, failing to explain the intricacies of red optimization. What the interesting thing was they saw a big influx of small local businesses because you know, when the quarantines hit, they could still do delivery and they were all sort of trying to figure out how do we do this? And this isn't necessarily an SEO thing, but the SEO is like a follow-up step from that because at first it's just, okay, how do, how do we, how do we fulfill orders for our customers in our area who want to, continue to be our patrons and we need to make deliveries to them. And then I think a next step from there is going to be them saying, okay, now that it's this world where in-person experiences have moved down and sort of mobile based, being able to find stuff for inbound, like delivery for your house is going up. Uh, how do we get found for that? So I would totally expect that the businesses that survive this carnage but haven't been able to focus on this stuff are going to have no choice. And some of the ones that don't have strong brands, meaning outside of online or that can use online to as a, as a feature, not a bug are going to have a hard time surviving. Unfortunately. When you think about, you know, the space of digital marketing, which is, you know, vast, obviously it's everything from paid to owned to SEO to social to earn, to, you know, PR, that whole world, inbound links. Um, do you have a sense of what door to message digital marketing through for these sort of uh, latecomers? 
you know, is because there's so much, I mean, you could talk in circles forever, or you could come in with a strong message that you think they'd respond to. What do you think that message is? Um, in, in general, I, when even thinking about SEO, I break it into two categories, foundational and growth. Foundational is all of the basics. Like, can somebody looking for you? Can they find you? If someone's looking up, you know, Neapolitan pizza and you would do Neapolitan pizza, then you want to be super optimized for that and just make sure that people that are looking for exactly what you are can find you. Whereas growth stuff is more of, okay, we want to get creative and do more stuff and connect, connect with t customers across m multiple touch points, maybe create content, whatever. I'd say every business at the minimum should do the foundation. And just even an example, you know when you you know a business in your neighborhood and you look it up because you want to see the hours, but they're not on Google Maps or something, and you think, oh, how are they not on here? And it's that sort of thing where just make it easy for people to do the very basics. And beyond that, I mean, I'm a big fan of earned, and especially when you can turn owned into earned. So one tactic I like, working on with clients is when you create some sort of de data driven asset. So if you're a, a B2B platform, you have all this platform data. When you look at a time like COVID where there's all this uncertainty and people want data, you create this asset, which is owned and people can find, but then also you can get other people to comment on it and even get some PR around it, which becomes earned. So it all depends on the type of business, but I would say start with the foundation and then think about how you can turn owned assets into earned media. All right, let's play another game. It's going to, this is a word association game. I'm going to say a word and you say Dangerous. the first word that comes into your mind, okay? And All just right. Be free with it, man. There's no right or wrong answer here. This is not like, oh, if he does this, he's smart. We're just trying to get, you know, free association here and see what comes out of it, okay? All right. SEO. First thing. All right. Uh, easy money. Digital marketing. Uh, obfuscated. Email marketing. Uh, never going away. Demand generation. What does that mean, really? Content marketing. Uh, go all the way or don't do it at all. Lead generation. Uh, the the fun underbelly of the internet. Interesting. Do you think the term lead generation is a sleazy term? Oh, I, I guess the, the word association revealed that my subconscious does. But uh, I mean, I've worked with like pretty upmarket brands that love the term lead generation. So I don't think so necessarily. I think about it also though with like, I've talked to people who have these weird like lead gen sort of schemes for like, you know, local plumbers or that sort of thing. So I think that's very much sort of old school online marketing is sort of how do you just do lead gen for these businesses that aren't sure how to do it. But then of course the term lead gen, when you strip it of any preconceived notions you might have, it just means generate leads, which at that point just means doing whatever you can do to connect with your potential customers. So it all depends how jaded you are, I guess. My sense from talking to um, late comers to digital marketing, you know, is that lead generation means uh, list brokers. Exactly. That's sort of what I'm, I guess, getting at. And again, I see both sides of it. Like I see where lead gen is just getting lists and like figuring out weird ways to solicit, to solicit cost, lists of leads and then sell them to other people. But then lead generation can also just be a synonym for, you know, customer acquisition, for example, but it's all in the, it's all in the nuance, I suppose. You know, um, when, when you think about intent, do you discern any difference between online marketing and digital marketing? Hmm. What do you mean by intent? Well, would you expect to find different search results for online marketing than you would for digital marketing? Yeah, I would. I think digital marketing, I would 
I, I mean, this is something my, my part of my answer is like a smart ass answer of we should just look at do the search results and see that that's my own you, research you process. Do it, right now? do it right now. Can you do you have a would you mind? Yeah, well, I, I'm in. A, I'm also going to get Spanish results, which will be interesting. But uh, I'll, I'll do it as well. Do I'm doing yeah. it as well. And I'm going to just do an incognito. Yeah. Search here. Um, so they seem kind of similar. And there's actually so there's some overlap in the results where like, for example, when you search online marketing, some of the results are targeted to digital marketing. And when you search digital marketing, there's a couple online marketing, but I'm seeing a like somewhat of a separation and it might just be that there's a slight deviation in intent. And then I have, I also have my own sort of hypothesis on it. So I'm seeing uh, HubSpot, digital marketer, Neil Patel, disruptive advertising, Wikipedia, smart insights, uh, smart insights again, and then investopedia that's for digital marketing, and now let me do online marketing. I'm seeing Neil Patel. I'm seeing Quick Sprout, Optimizely, Forbes, Blogspot, HubSpot, HubSpot, Marketing Land, uh, Balance SMB, WordStream. So definitely, you know, the same guys, and then some new some new players like. Quick Sprout comes up under online marketing, but not digital marketing. And Optimizely comes up under online marketing and not digital marketing. So does so online own, marketing yeah. mean an, an online SaaS marketing tool and digital marketing means someone who provides that service? I believe they are very similar in maybe online marketing is a little more informational where it's sort of, it's two ways to say the same thing but the people that would use one over the other are going to have some more commonalities, I suppose. And in my mind, online marketing is less of like digital marketing is more of an industry term. Like when people tell me, like when I, when I introduce myself to a, someone on a hike in Catalonia that, and I'm stumbling my way through Spanish and they ask what I do, I would say online marketing. And then from there I'll say like, you know, sort of, organic acquisition and sale, which is SEO in Spanish. And so I, I would say that online marketing is more of the, it's the same concept, but less of a jargony and digital marketing is more like you already know a little bit if you're searching that because that's more of an industry term. And online marketing is just the word online and the word marketing and it's self-explanatory. So, you know, Nigel is a very cool name. Like, I think there's some famous songs where the word, or the name Nigel's in there. And, you know. Making I, plans I, for Nigel. It's a classic. Right. I've always had a fascination with what makes cool. What makes something cool? Because it's intangible. You know, the idea that you would sort of be able to manufacture exclusivity and desirability for a nightclub or a brand of some kind. It's, it's, it's very elusive. So I want to talk to you about, about kind of your online profile because there's very little content available about you via organic search. And I'm inclined to think that's intentional. Is it? It's not unintentional. Can you, can you talk more about it or? It's maybe it's, it's, it's some sort of, I think, natural disposition I have, but because my job involves doing research on things and people and all that sort of stuff, I take some sort of solace in the fact that if you really want to learn something about me, then we have to have a conversation about it. And I've been fortunate enough in my career to, you know, a lot of people for, sort of lead gen, their personal brand becomes a source of leads and stuff. And I think that's totally cool and fine. I like to have a separation there where there's the work I do and I have a company and we're in the process of doing more sort of branding activities around that. And then there's me and I haven't, I mean, I'm pretty well versed in all the things one could do to increase discoverability in that. And 
I like having uh, sort of a separation of church and state there, shall we say. So, yeah, it's, uh, I would say it's not an accident. Do, do, is there something to be said f- for, for a consultant? Uh, is there something to be said for making yourself a little difficult to reach? Is there a benefit in that? And if so, what is it? Oh, I mean, I don't know. You, you, I think you can make a stronger argument for that it's boneheaded, but uh, I think um, it works for me. And in the same way that uh, if you had said to me, Nigel, or if I said to you, I, I want to start a successful company and hire a team and build a great referral network by doing excellent work and get connected to influential people who can then create a virtuous cycle. And then I said, I'm also considering going to the Thai wilderness. You probably would have said, Nigel, that sounds like your goal and the way you want to go about it are not exactly in line. And what I've sort of settled on, I guess, generally in life is sort of figuring there's a playbook and a best practices for everything. But then if you can do things in a way that are sort of adherent to your own beliefs and then you, you really manifest those in the way you handle yourself, then it can go from a, fe- from a bug to a feature. So, yeah, I mean, again, there's, I think the, the, for 90% of people, it's do everything to be found and make that possible. But maybe when you're doing more of a higher-end exclusive offering, it can actually work in your favor. Although I'd be lying if I said that was uh, some grand master plan. Well, it's interesting because if you think about, you know, distribution, how products or services are distributed, certainly the means of distribution has an impact on the likelihood of a sale. So, I mean, could you be perhaps, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but could you be arguing that for a high ticket sort of dollars up, days down offering, if you're going to be a high price consultant who makes a lot of money and whose objective is to work less and make more, then it's actually better to make yourself difficult to reach. I think the distribution part there is 100% right. And that's why when I look at the, you know, the Pareto of where could I, where could I put in the least amount of effort to get the most amount of return? It's just having relationships with the few people that other people trust and can make solid references. And that's where, again, that's why I don't have to worry too much. And I've, I've never had to do any sort of marketing, really, because I've done work that I like to think has gone very well. And then sort of those people I've worked with is, have sort of branched out and told others. And, yeah, again, the when you get a really solid referral, there's so many data points that indicate there's nothing like that. So when I look about how do I scale myself, it's just getting more of those, not – you know, ranking for what is SDO or something like that. So then, you know, by the same argument, if you were talking to say a law firm, you know, this is obviously, you know, this is not necessarily the type of, refer- and let's not talk about a plaintiff firm, but let's, let's talk about, you know, a, a corporate firm that represents big organizations. They're not necessarily going to get hired off of a Google search. So should those types of firms be SEOing their sites or do they really not need to? Like, you know, you look at like the talent agencies in Hollywood and they've long sort of played at arm's length distance to the web and been just fine. They put up a single page. It's got contact information and a phone number. That's it. And it's obviously intentional as a way of manufacturing desirability and exclusivity and, and coolness by making them tough to reach. Do you think those types of organizations are can benefit less from digital marketing because that's sort of their whole, you know, their whole image is, you know, hard to get? Yep, I think you nailed it. And it's maybe even less so the hard to get part. And I mean, I guess that is it because even if, if, this, if it's an exclusive thing that comes through referrals and you're trying to manufacture scarcity, then by virtue of, presenting yourself in a way that shows I'm trying to sell you on myself, you're kind of undercutting your own branding. And to your other question about, are there a bunch of companies that don't need digital marketing? The answer is unequivocally yes. Like the, I would say the foundational for them is, can I even find a phone number or email for you or something like that? And then maybe there's a certain pantheon of scarcity where you don't even want that. And it's like, no, 
you won't contact me, I'll contact you or whatever. But um, I think absolutely. I One thing I think people make a mistake of in any discipline is they assume that everyone should be doing it. So whether it's paid marketing or PR or SEO, like, I don't think SEO is perfect for anyone. And even a lot of times digital marketing isn't necessary for a business where the best types of customers you're going to get are referrals and scarcity is good. So yeah, I agree. Um, for those companies that are late to the party, they got hit by COVID, they're caught like a deer in the headlights and they realize they have to compete online and deliver online and they're looking to hire someone and they don't know the people that you know or that I know. They're outside the bubble. What should they look for when they're hiring an SEO? Well, even before, because I guess it depends what type of business they are, because even that that question assumes that they know that SEO is what they need. And there's a lot of, there's people that have skill sets complementary to mine that I don't have a mastery of, which is they're sort of all around growth people. And they can go in and look at a company and sort of do an audit across, they may not be like an all out master in any single one area, but they know them all pretty well. So they can say, hey, like, there's the, when I look at your whole portfolio, it's obvious that like if it's a local business, your Google maps is something. And if for another business, it might be your paid is incredibly inefficient or you're not even doing it at all. So I think maybe even starting with a generalist just to help you figure out what you need. And it, when it comes to SEO, I think it's very easy to underestimate what you know or what your judgment can be. Cause a lot of this is, like, you know, uh, I think Elon Musk's approach to hiring is keep asking why until they either tell you all the details or they reveal that they never actually did this stuff and they're just good at job interviews. I think it's the same thing with SEO or anything, where if you just ask them, how would you approach a company like mine? And then you just ask why, if they start stumbling or saying, oh, well, you know, algorithms and like giving BS answers, then, and they can't explain it to you in a in a simple way that you can understand, then it's probably not someone you want to work with because if they can't explain it to you, then they're going to end up going off into a corner and maybe there won't be a good communication there because they can't say, here, you understand what I'm doing. I can put it into words that you can understand. What are your thoughts on sort of SEO agencies versus freelancers, particularly given the widespread adoption of remote working as a result of the pandemic you're a remote company, you have been, but not most companies are not. They've actually, you know, convene in a common place and, you know, text message each other from different desks. But, um, but do you think that this whole idea now that everyone, I mean, you know, my, my, my son's grandmother uses Zoom now and she's a technophobe. Everybody is using Zoom. I'm sure Slack is next. So, I mean, does this mean that it's no longer really necessary to have an agency that you could just hire a quarterback and build a team of freelancers, assuming they're competent. You can, you, you can tell who's competent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so my, my answer to that has evolved over time because at first I was a freelancer. And then when I was in the early days of building my own team, it was basically sort of, it was almost like a couple freelancers that worked together and shared notes. And then over time, what we've actually done is built up a lot of knowledge across similar companies and systems. So even, I mean, I found for myself that when I was in-house, I thought I knew what I was doing. And then looking back, my data set was so limited because I'd only worked with a few companies and even, and then done a couple freelance things. But then once I started having to think beyond myself of, okay, I'm working with different companies. That was the freelance step. And then it was, how do I build systems? And when you're forced to scale yourself, you're forced to think a lot more efficiently and think about the, the sort of correlations amongst things. So I don't think there's necessarily anything inherently wrong with any one of them. I think the, the thing about an agency is you get to collect different perspectives and align them under shared processes. So on my team, there's certain things that we'll sort of learn working with one company that we can take to another company. And because there's multiple people with balancing strengths working on stuff, I think the learning is a lot more exponential. And then because it's an agency, we have more resources to invest in getting better in those areas. 
the um, you know there is a a a a consensus in SEO these days that if you want to rank first for something, you need to be more thorough, more comprehensive than what's ranking first already. Uh, but you have a slightly different view on that, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I think that that's the sort of traditional approach where it's, it was pioneered by a few people who are well known in the space. Is that basically see what everyone else is doing and do more of it. And when you think about the way that you interact with anything, I don't think length is, and even necessarily having everything right on that one page is necessarily the best thing. I mean, some of, I know that I watch lots of short clips on YouTube and it's not like I'm, I'm probably more likely to watch five two minute clips than I am to watch one 10 minute clip because unfortunately I have this device in my pocket that's always sucking my attention away to other things. And when you think about how Google determines what's a good result, all they had historically was sort of what is the content on the page and how many links are pointing to it. And both of those are kind of gameable, but what you can't game as much is are people engaging with it and fulfilling the intent. And if you can fulfill intent with less or just help give someone, instead of writing a 10,000, 20,000 page article, bring them to a one page where they can sort of opt in and find what they're looking for. As far as Google's concerned, that's a better result. And the only problem is Google historically has had a hard time determining that result without just throwing all the content at it. But they're getting better at that. And I'm seeing more and more evidence that when you fulfill search intent and just convey enough to Google what your page is about, then you can win out over the people who have written obnoxious 30,000 word guides. So by fulfilling intent, you're, are you talking just about the on-page content or whether or not the search session ends at that, at that query? It depends on the query because if you look up like uh, – I think maybe an example is what, what time does the Super Bowl start? Which people used to make a bunch of money off that. And then Google just started pulling the, the information right into results. So now there's not that much click through to that. But when you look at other things where I just want to check something and if I click through and come back, Google's going to view that differently than I want to understand the history of the Syrian war, maybe, where they'll probably determine over time that intent for that means that I spend more time and another metric Google looks at is how many follow-up searches do I have? So if someone is not doing follow-up searches after landing on your page and Google has data that shows that not doing follow-up searches, they believe that's fulfilling intent and that's what it is. But for other ones, fulfilling intent might just be, Hey, I wanted to check this real quick and that's okay for those both to be right. You, you get it. You know, I wrote this paper. I just published a paper on uh, media measurement. And uh, those platform providers are all getting into AI now. And they're marketing heavily against AI. So, so the, the research involved a, a deep dive into sort of AI, where we are, what it can do, where we're going. And you know what I found is that when you get into the area of computationally trying to figure out what is best or what is true, it's a slippery slope because computers still can't discern meaning which is why artificial intelligence is still so far away and why Facebook and Twitter still can't debunk fake news. So, so if the objective is crisp, crisp, concise language, what metrics can a rules-based algorithm that has no capacity to understand wit, humor, emotion, or style sh have to shift from the skyscraper to a shorter, more consumable you know, piece of content online? Um, I think it, it's still, I mean, that's a good question. I think it still comes back to, is the search intent being fulfilled? So if I look up something and then I go and I keep looking at other pages, like I'm bouncing, I'm pogo sticking back from search results to a page, it implies to Google that you didn't fulfill the search intent on the first one. But for some things, to your point, it might be that you read that, that was cool. And then you went on to something else. And I think you've sort of landed on the, a lot of people, when they talk about SEO, they like to say that search intent is some firm thing that Google knows everything. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a bunch of computers guessing what things are 
and they get things wrong all the time. And this is also where the magic of, I think, organic marketing comes in because you can look at all these metrics. You can use tools to say, hey, if we want to rank on this topic, we should include this, this, and this. But it's still differentiation ultimately comes down to a hypothesis about makes what makes something cool. And to your earlier point about sort of what is something catchy, all that sort of stuff. Maybe it's some in some dystopian future, computers will figure that out. But what I love about this line of work is you can take all these data-driven inputs and they're only as good as the hypothesis, as the creative hypothesis is built upon. So, okay, people are looking up this. They want to see this. How do we do it differently? And that's the type of thing, marrying that with the data-driven stuff that Google is never going to get perfect at. And as practitioners, you're never going to be able to rely on tools to give you everything you need to create something that's interesting. It is, could the answer be a microsite? So instead of, uh, you know, a, a skyscraper with all these, with a, with a headline and all these H2 subheadlines, um, it's really just a series of links that links to deeper pages for the H2s. I mean, because that would give you everything with a relationship with a network of links. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, I, I've done that successfully where we're, one company I work with, we had a long blog post about the subject of heat maps, which is like one of their main product offerings. And then it was doing well, but it could be doing better, both in terms of conversion, engagement, and traffic. So then we took that one page and we built a little site around it. And we said, okay, instead of having this one long page, we'll have sort of the introductory page and then a chapter, a short chapter on each part. And what we found was click through to different sections was higher. People converted better probably because they weren't drowning in a sea of words. And because it was a, a more pleasant experience and relatable experience to look at, meaning it's, it's this sort of structured instead of a big long page, you got more links. And then all of those fed into it getting more traffic. So I am, to your point, becoming more and more of a fan of creating these mini experiences as opposed to a series of one-off long assets that don't really connect to anything. So I saved the, uh, the last question is the geek out question. So if people, if you don't want to hear the geek out question, you can tune out now. Uh, but I want to geek out for a second and talk about structured content. Cause I know it's something you talk, you talk quite a bit about uh, specifically. Uh, I want to talk about the difference between lists, H twos and H threes. So what are some situations where you choose to implement, if you're going for snippets, what are some situations where you choose to implement a list versus an H tag? Um, I think you can actually do both because the whole thing with all, with all of this structured formatting, it's about trying to force feed to Google, hey, here's this information. Is this the format you want? And I actually like to do both, but I think an easy answer, it's like with everything in marketing, how do you do both? Yeah. Uh, so let's say you have a list of best restaurants in San Francisco and your H2 is best restaurants in San Francisco. And then the H3 is restaurant one, H3, restaurant two, H3, restaurant three. You can have that, but then above that, say something like, hey, for a quick, for a quick summary, here's a list of the top 10 restaurants and then just header and a list. And then, say, and then at the end of that, just to make it not awkward, say, now for a thorough deep dive into each one, read on. And then in the next section, you can see the H2 and H3. And I like, and I've actually, as recently as last week, I think, suggested that where we saw a competitor for one of our clients was laying in a snippet and we had the H2, H3 structure, but we didn't have a list. So we said, hey, let's add a list. And that's worked in the past just by kind of making it, giving Google more options to take the information and display it. You know, um, Yoast recently uh, included these structured data blocks, and they have two types for WordPress users. One is called a how-to data block. The other is called an FAQ data block. Any opinions on those? Uh, yes, they are both great ways to improve your click-through. Uh, I've seen in many cases where, because if you, if you do a search, you'll see the FAQ and the how-to markup. It's like this, this list of questions or for the how-to case, uh, like sort of how-tos below search results. 
And they are hilariously obnoxious in search results. It take, like on mobile, it takes up almost your whole screen. On desktop, it'll be like the result with the FAQ, and it takes up the space of two or three results. And I've consistently seen over my career that anything that makes you stand out in search results is good. So even if you look at schema markup, it's just a shiny thing. Shiny things help with click-through. Click-through helps you end up getting higher positions. So with FAQ, the reason I really like it is it's another way that you can hit on some of those related topics to, to be make a page relevant without bogging down your whole page. You know those pages that are forever, like to get to the part you want, you have to go through, what is this? Why are this? What is this? Like, so you can actually move some of that to the bottom. And then when you mark it up with FAQ, you're killing two birds with one stone because you find a way to include it. And then you can rank for it. Like if you search heat maps right now, we just got this implemented with Hotjar and we've seen the click through go up on this page and it just takes up way more of the search result. And so I would say if you're creating content where you can come up with any excuse to add an FAQ on the page, do it and add the markup. Do you have differences of opinions between the FAQ and the how to? Um, I want to say, I think how to is only on mobile. So I would go with, right? so uh, I might be wrong about that, but I'm almost sure. So I think in general, I think the FAQ is great, but if you get mostly mobile traffic and it's more conducive to it, how to, then I think the how to results actually look a little bit more distinct. So that could make sense in some occasions. Well, let me show you the HTML. You see it? That's the HTML for the how-to block. Mm -hmm. Is that mobile only? It's, I think it's more about Google only shows it on mobile results. Again, like now I kind of just want to go double check that, but from the last I recall, it's not that, it's not that the markup is to mobile only, it's that for, for this type of schema, Google only shows it on mobile. And the FAQ could be either. Yeah. Well, Nigel, uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh, school us on the finer points of search engine optimization and growth marketing. And if someone is motivated enough to try to hunt you down, how would they do it? I would say through my website, marketingog.com, or you could try to track me down on LinkedIn as well, which I don't know what my thing is. So to your point, you'd have to be motivated, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Just a tip, a pro tip. You might want to mention his cat. Yep. It, it, it gets the job done. It, it increases conversion. All right. Thanks so much. Yep. Thanks, Eric. I have to jump in a second.